my humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Seva Sangran, Guru Piran New, fellow Nyanis. Today is a very auspicious day. Today, 2nd May, is the birthday of uh, our founder, Jagat Guru Nyanavalal Paranjodi Mahan. Uh, all over the world, people are celebrating his birthday. Uh, today, we are doing it uh, online, but we will have the main celebration on Saturday, uh, physical on Saturday. This online one is to facilitate uh, people who are you know, outstation. Uh, some of them are from overseas. Uh, so uh, this today we will commemorate the celebration by speaking about Mahan, uh, his life story, uh, some of the struggles that he had in his life, some of the things, ways he overcame these challenges, the questions that was lingering in his mind, what prompted him to pursue this journey, this life journey, uh, this life journey, what I call a journey that is impactful, not only for him, for his family, but also for thousands and thousands of people who benefited from the meditation method that he discovered and the philosophy that he has, you know, discovered by himself uh, and he's brought it in his book, his uh, important book called The I God Philosophy. It unifies many different branches of meditation, different schools of thought, all integrated into a simple life manual for all of us to follow. So today I want to commemorate and give thanks to Mahan. And I want to speak today, devote today's satsang to his life journey. So I'm going to speak about uh, Mahan's uh, biography a little bit for those who may not know. A life story of uh, this great person who has had tremendous impact on many people's lives, including mine and my family. Then I'll speak about the essential concept in, in the biography, I'll also speak about how he met his guru, how you know he discovered how he learned, and how he incorporated and did a lot of research himself. You know, he was very, very introspective, contemplative, reflective in discovering simple ways of unlocking the power within oneself. Once he has once he discovered this power within himself, he started, you know, going deeper, trying to understand not only himself, the self, but also understanding the universe around him, within him. And he pursued this journey of discovery, you know, intensive effort that he put in to discover who he was, what this universe is, and what God, the creator, is. So discovering the creator, you know, his, in his writings, he writes that when I discover the creator, I can discover everything about the creation. So the pursuit intensified over the years and he wrote his journey, his life journey in this book called I Got or in Tamil Nan Kadavu. In there, he talks about from philosophy to social changes that we need to make, the transformation in the mind, you know, the wealth, how do we generate wealth in a very divinized way? Mahan does not, you know, uh, like many play, you know, many people that say, look, you know, you've got to give up everything. Mahan sh shows that how one can divinize every aspect of one's life. Finally, learning to outlive, live to outlive everything. So here I will speak about how his life journey, how he, he himself, saw the transformation that was taking place in him, which he documented. He discovered this new concept called I-God philosophy. And in that process, he refined his meditational method. So there was this discovery of this self-exploration, this meditation through research, and that enhanced his understanding of himself and the universe as he became more and more aware of it. There was a refinement on the meditational method. And he made it so simple that anyone 
you know, any walks of life, you know, and, you know, any social status, you know, whether they are men or women, you know, whether they are young or old, you know, they are, you know, different jobs, you know, not only monks, but also people of all walks of life can practice this and attain an enlightened life. So he put in a lot of effort to refine the meditational method in three simple steps. And when one practices this, you'll see that they become more aware. There's a sense of mindfulness, the sense of serenity, the sense of clarity, a sense of you know understanding of everything in life becomes more peaceful, more productive, and more and more universal. I'll speak a little bit of Mahan's meditation method. Then I'll speak about some of the benefits of this I God philosophy and Mahan's uh, meditational method. So I'm going to discuss today his life, you know, life story or biography, the, his discoveries, and what are the benefits of this discovery. So let me start with this. So Mahan was born in 1900. So, so here is the plan that I want to cover, which I, I spoke about. The first thing is, first part is about biography of Mahan. Mahan was born in India, this town called Kansapuram, you know, in Ramana district, to a respectable family, you know, uh, uh, you know, and he, very, very uh, religious family, and uh, he had very good training in his own religion. And <clears throat> that kept him thinking a lot on, you know, because of this intensity of this, you know, training that he had from his family, they were all very devout and very, very religious. So he started learning intensively. And there was always this question that, you know, about the creator, about the creation, and finding his own place in this entire creation. So he started thinking. And at the age of 11, normally, you know, boys mature at the age of 11, 12 years old. He had a lot of questions in his mind. And one of the questions, which is really a key milestone in Swamiji's life, was the question when there was a coronation of the king. And at that time, India was still under the rule of the British, uh, uh, you know, empire. On 11 November 1911, the king and the queen left Portsmouth. They were coming to India. Uh, this is the first time. The king is, you know, visiting, um, you know, after the coronation, you know, he boarded the RMS Medina to the Indian Empire. And there was a lot of celebration. The streets were filled with, you know, uh, many things, you know, it was like a fanfare. And many people were waiting to see the queen, the uh, king, as he was passing through. And uh, those days, you know, uh, being the head of the government, you know, and being coronated. Uh, there's a lot of celebration, very similar to what we have in in Malaysia and many countries where, you know, uh, when there's a coronation, there's a big celebration. So during that coronation celebration, uh, Mahan asked uh, an elderly person, you know, uh, why are we celebrating this? Uh, why is it so great for this one person? And... Uh, this elderly person told him, look, uh, this is the king of our country and not only our country, the entire empire that covers so many countries. And uh, so he says he's a very great man. He you know, rules the entire empire. Uh, and that's why we are celebrating and we are part of the empire. And somebody was very curious. Wow, there's so much celebration, so much festivities, you know, uh, holidays and so on. And then he asked this question, you know, I've learned about uh, the creator, God, and so on. Are you telling me that the king is greater than, you know, uh, the creator? Is there somebody else greater than the king? And uh, this elderly man said, yes. While the king is, you know, supreme over the lands that the empire uh, conquered or, or rules, there is something there's someone far greater and more supreme than the king. 
And Swamiji's next question was that, wow, you know, we're here to see the supreme leader of our empire. And you're telling me that there is somebody more supreme? So I can see the king, you know, uh, on the streets and during the parade. But you're telling me that there are some someone who is more supreme than this supreme leader of our empire. And he says, how can I discover this supreme leader of this universe? I'm seeing the supreme leader of our empire. This is an 11-year-old boy asking this question. How do I see the supreme leader of our entire universe? Ah, he says, this person who's supreme is God. So Mahan asks, can I see God? And the elderly man says, yes. You can. You have, you know, you have the power to do it. If you have the faith in yourself and God, you can see God. So Mahan's mind then went on a search mode. He says, if you have faith in yourself and God, then uh, you can discover. So he says, I have so much faith. I, you know, I've been reading the scriptures. I've been learning, doing all the rituals. You know, why am I not able to see God? So you've got to go deeper. So at the age of 11 years old, Mahan's intensive search began. He wanted to discover this creator. And this elderly person told him that God is everywhere, including within you. You have to intensify to be able to see God. And this 11-year-old boy commenced this journey. So the coronation was a trigger for him. And this continued, you know, and he, as an 11-year-old boy, started intensifying. And what is really interesting is that he would be the first one that go to the place of worship, and he'd be the last one that leave, with the objective that perhaps, you know, that creator or God would come in before everybody and leave after. So Mahan said, okay, maybe I'll be able to catch him. Because I've been going to this place of worship and I cannot see him. I see a lot of people, but I cannot see him. Maybe when nobody is there, he comes in. And when everybody is gone, he leaves. So he intensified this. He'd be the first one and the last one leaving the place of worship. There was an elderly man that was just observing. And Mahan used to go and ask many people, you know, that, you know, that's God, where can I attain God, all those things. And this elderly person observed Mahan for a very long time. And he became, you know, started a conversation and started getting close to Mahan. And Mahan actually documents this in the book. So he bought Mahan a lot of food. He took a liking to Mahan. And then they started exchanging a lot of ideas. And Mahan, you know, had been asking a lot of questions. That's why he always says, you know, ask a lot of questions. Just asking, and the questions became deeper and deeper and deeper, right? And this elderly person saw that this young man is onto a journey to discover something far greater than his biology. And he says, this elderly person said, okay. After the conversation, as he got closer, he says, I can show you how to tap into that inner force in you. And on the 7th of January, 1938, at 11.11 p.m., he showed Mahan a particular method of making the mind quiet and experiencing that vibration in him. Immediately, Swamiji felt. And it's very interesting that many people would have tried this but this Mahan was ready, you know. And when he's ready, when somebody who is enlightened comes in the presence, you know, even by the words and simple touch, you'd feel the vibration. And this is exactly what Mahan experienced. But prior to this, he dreamt about this, even, you know, at this event that, that he spoke about it at about 2.30 p.m., you know, in this place called Sivagasi. So Mahan had this premonition of, uh, you know, 
experiencing this already in 1930. What, what that means is that as he was intensifying his search, he started getting visions of a great man, a great saint, an no enlightened person will come and show him the path. And this is exactly what happened to Mahan. But the important thing is that when the Guru gave him, and Mahan was searching, and in his mind, you know, like me, many people would have been searching. So normally, uh, you know, those days, the Gurus will only give it to selected people. And I presume this elderly person took a liking to Mahan. He saw Mahan was very, very dynamic, very intensive in his meditation, very diligent, come in early, go late. All those things. So you say, okay, maybe this is the person that I should teach. You know, most of these uh, great saints will not give it to everyone. They will only select and give. So, and what is very interesting is that after giving him this diksha, Mahan uh, asked him that, you know, and this elderly person, you know, uh, if you're going to give it, give it only to the selected people not to everybody. But Mahan in his mind said, if I was searching for so many years, you know, why don't we give this out liberally? So he said, I wanted to give it to everyone without any expectation. So the Guru could not take it back. Normally the Guru will ask, promise you, okay, don't reveal this to everyone. But in this case, he's given him that power, but he could not take it back. So he said, never mind, do what you think is right. So Mahan then uh, started doing a lot of research. So on the 8th of 7th, 1938, remember that he got his initiation 7th January, almost six months, seven months. And he intensified his meditation. And one day when he came out of his uh, meditational Everybody said, hey, you look like a guru. There was a glow in him. And Mahan himself felt it. And that changed. He was a businessman in, in Rangoon those days. You know, Rangoon is now uh, in, in uh, Myanmar or Burma. So Mahan then, you know, realized that he has, you know, discovered this, this divine force in him and doing normal professions you know, was not his main focus. His main focus was essentially to discover this truth and share it to everybody. That changed him completely. And he stopped his job, gave up his business, and he went back to India. Here's something very interesting. When he gave up everything and went back to India, it wasn't easy. He struggled. You know, at that time, he also had a wife, you know, a small family. His uh, first uh, uh, child, who's a son, passed away you know, at a very young age. He had a daughter. So he had to look after this family, and there was no job, and they were in absolute poverty. Right? But he never gave up. He intensified his meditation. Slowly, slowly, people noticed him. They came to him for you know, learning about this meditation. And slowly disciples came and they brought him, you know, food and other things. And finally, he realized that his objective in life is not like an ordinary professional person, but his, his main objective in his life is to impart this knowledge of this Kundalini meditation. So at a very early age, you know, he had this intensive search. He discovered an elderly person, a guru, to guide him. He intensified this. There was a glow in him. And, you know, there's, there's this fervor of pursuing this all his life. Even, you know, getting himself and the family into poverty. Because he needed to spend a lot of time, this, you know, doing research. This requires intensive research. Same like a scientist and a, you know, a researcher. <laughs> Excuse me. Same like a scientist. Excuse me. Same like a scientist and a researcher. Sometimes you devote a lot of your time in the laboratory. And 
uh, and you devote a lot of your time into uh, discovery. And sometimes, uh, you know, you don't have time for anything. So this Mahan spent a lot of time on, on research, trying to make it simple, trying to make this teaching simple and accessible to everybody. So his journey started on refining this meditational method. And that gave him time. So there was no profession. He just intensified and started teaching everybody. And slowly, slowly, as disciples gathered, he established the Universal Peace Sanctuary in 1942. So almost four years. He worked really hard. He had some very, uh, you know, uh, good disciples good disciples that actually helped him to 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 establish this universal peace sanction. And that journey started. And you see that, you know, Mahan's journey started and he traveled in India imparting this knowledge. And what is really interesting is obviously, you know, he had to go through the challenges, but in the early phases, uh, he had to explain this this teaching in a very simple way and there was a lot of competing schools of thought uh, that was out there of course many of them uh, many of it these schools gave him a lot of challenges questioning him you know what his discovery was and so on similar to a scientist when you put out something there's a lot of critical review and mahan went through that and uh, what is uh, very inter interesting is that, you know, Mahan's uh, uh, mother tongue was not Tamil. It was actually Urdu. And so he was learning Tamil also at the time. And uh, slowly, slowly, he became very proficient in Tamil. He started imparting this knowledge to everyone. And the crowds started coming. People of all, uh, you know, uh, strata of society, you know, from monks to priests to you know, uh, you, professionals, they started coming. And he started giving talks in many, many places of how you can discover this in a very simple way, you know, and how it links back to the spiritual self that is spoken about in all the religions. So here are some of the photographs Mahat in his early years that, uh, you know, travel around the world. Here again, this is Mahan at a very uh, early days. 40s and, you know, 50, some of the pictures that he visited many, many people that, you know, wanted to learn about this new discoveries spoken about in many, many uh, scriptures, you know, and you, there are many complicated ways, many things in complicated languages, but this Mahan made it so simple. You know, even a person who is not educated could practice this. And this discovery was, you know, he said that this vibration, you don't have, there's no word, nor a sound that you need to write or chant. It's about an experience. So the technique he has uh, discovered is, he says that, in Tamil, he says, this vibration that has got no words to describe. So there is no rituals. The only thing that you need to do is sit down quietly and meditate. I'll go through the techniques. Shortly. So Mahan traveled in many places across the globe. He went to Europe. He went to across India. He went to Sri Lanka. He came to Southeast Asia. At that time, uh, Malaya. And people, you know, and he started imparting this knowledge to everybody. Those days, some of this knowledge is only kept among very close people and only uh, men uh, can practice this, but he opened it up to everybody. Householders. So again, here you see that Mahan with many disciples and one of the pictures is in, in uh, Singapore. Here again in Europe, he was traveling. He traveled to many, many places of worship, many saints and sages that came out and got their initiation. They have spoken about it. They have not experienced it, many of them, and come to this Mahan to experience this. So here again, uh, many uh, of his travels and the pictures that I was able to get from our archives. So Mahan traveled around the world, but he then also visited Malaysia about five to six times. First trip was in 1953, 
and then 57, 58, 1963, 1969, he came to Malaysia, but he could not come into the country because at the time there were some challenges. In 1976, he came back to Malaysia and in 1980 was his last journey. And interestingly, 1979, in his birthday celebration in India, he mentioned that in 1980, he would like to spend his uh, a birthday in Malaysia. That would be the last, uh, you know, mortal birthday that he celebrated with all of us. So here is uh, the visits, uh, the pictures of Mahan's visits uh, to our KL Center, our main headquarters. At that time, it used to be in Guru Sangaran's house on the hill. There are a lot of disciples that are there that came to see Mahan. Uh, this is in the picture of Mahan arriving in 1976 and uh, you know, with all the disciples. Uh, he visited Singapore, um, you know, and uh, one of the important speech he gave was during Merdeka Day in 1980. We had a big function, and there he spoke about his philosophy and why the philosophy is very important for modern-day life, uh, how it is very pragmatic, very simple, and if one practices this, they'll be able to live a productive and prosperous life. So this speech was given on Merdeka Day in 1980. That is, we had a big dinner because he was leaving for back for India on the 3rd of September, three, four days. So again, this is the celebration that we had uh, in, uh, in 1980, a very grand celebration, thousands of people that came. Uh, and uh, the whole day, uh, you know, was spent from morning, afternoon, and uh, evening was the birthday celebration. Uh, and uh, it was uh, very grand. And after the celebration, we had he sat for meditation, and uh, you know we had a group meditation. And in that meditation, you can actually see his aura, with the you know the, the the kind of glow that he had, uh, which most uh, great saints and sages have when they you know practice intensively. And here are some of the pictures when he's leaving for India back. And what is really interesting is that Mahan uh, uh, came alone on his own at the age of 80, if you see him carrying the bag. And he also left. There's no, uh, you know, disciples following him and assisting. He did everything on his own. Right? He traveled on his own. He came to Malaya, Malaysia on his own. And he went back on his own. So again, uh, he was very, very independent, very strong. So you see the picture on the right-hand side is actually him leaving in Subang Airport on his own. So here is a great man that essentially had the strong mindset from a young age onwards to be able to, to know uh, about the creator, the creation, and the self. <clears throat> he pursued this uh, intensively. Along this journey, he started introspecting intensively. And he started thinking about much more deeper. He was exposed to many philosophies at a very young age. But he wanted to unify it and make sure that it's accessible to everybody. <laughs> and what he did was that, you know, he started thinking, okay, I'm feeling this vibration. Where is this vibration coming from? You know, how does it relate to the universal vibration? He started thinking deeply, like a scientist. Then he realized, he stumbled across, he discovered this I got philosophy. He started thinking about, you know, this formless form, this concept in his book, I got book, which he starts off with Irul, this nothingness. Here, most people think that it's absence of matter and energy. No, it's actually about this, you know, it's not, it's not that nothing is there. It is actually no thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a substratum which is neither matter nor energy. You know, in a subtle way, he's describing this. If it's neither matter nor energy, then it is something what is referred to as supra matter and supra energy, which is transcendental to matter and energy. And that's what we call spirit, which is neither matter nor energy. In a very simple way, he, he characterizes that. And he says, from that, everything emerges. Right. So he says, that's the infinite possibility. 
right? And that's the big eye that he speaks about. And that's what the source of all creation. He says that in that space, you know, there is no time, there is no matter, there is no space, there is no energy, right? We all go into that space every day in our deep sleep state where time, space, everything disappears. He says that happens in deep sleep, but it also happens in deep meditation. So through his meditational process, he was get, able to get into that space and he describes that in his I God book as a starting concept. And then he says, where did this all emerge from? And he says, our universe began from this, you know, dimensionless, timeless. That's where all our dimensions come in. But oftentimes we try to capture this nothingness space with our matter energy. See, this is the challenge that we have. So it describes this rule and then it defines our universe very, very clearly. For me, this was fantastic because here is a Mahan, a saint, a sage, is speaking like a scientist, you know, with deep introspection, contemplation, reflection. But what is fascinating is that like how scientists have the laboratory to examine minute things using electron microscope or using a telescope to gaze the stars. This Mahan was using not a telescope or microscope, but his inner scope to transform his mind and all his intellect as a laboratory of analysis, what he called inner scope. Ah, he says everything emerges from there. If the matter body goes silent into that deep, what he calls the ero state, he says, even though we may have a body, you know, our material personality, time, everything disappears. So that is also embedded in us. So he starts off with that. So everything starts with that, that space, the nothingness space. And that's why he came up with this concept, nothing, something by chance. Nothing, everything it starts with this no matter thing, you no know, matter and energy. Matter and energy arrived. And you can ask this why this is the case. I've given a very detailed analysis of this in, in our YouTube channel. Something, this is our three-dimensional space and time by chance. Chance here is that the probability of infinite possibilities of this happening. So Mahan here is speaking a scientific language, even though he has never been to the traditional way of scientific training. But through deep introspection, it is leading him to that. So he says nothing, no thing. Transcendental, this is our universe, and this is out of all the infinite possibilities, the material universe is one of the possibilities. So here, for me, he is speaking a scientific language in a systematic way, breaking down. So he shows that how this nothing, something by chance led to this, this primordial atom, or what you can call it, you know, today science calls it, uh, you know, the Big Bang, or, you know, where everything originated space and time, and the entire universe emerged. So Swamiji then describes this. This is in 1940. He's trying to explain how this universe, so he shows everything starts with this. Hence, the DNA of the divinity, the creator, must be embedded in everything in this universe, including ourselves. So how do we discover this? We can't use telescope or microscope because that's only for matter and energy. We can, we, the only way to discover this formless dimensional substratum is to get into a state that gives you that. And that is actually our meditational sadhana, which is actually trying to understand our mind, to be able to explore this substratum called the mind, which is neither matter nor energy. So again, this meditational approach, and I'll show you how he does this. So this whole concept he worked out. And, and he says that is a cosmic intelligence. This is what he called wisdom, you know. And it amplifies in everything in this universe. He says everything is the evolution of the universe. All we need to do is for our mind to 
become aware of the DNA, divine nectar of awareness, experience it and be it. Right? And, and to get to that level requires like a scientist slowly looking carefully. He says, oh, true, true, noka, noka. He says, looking very, very carefully, intensively, like in an electron microscope or telescope, you will be able to become aware of it, experience it, and be it. Very similar to uh, using electron microscope, going through the cellular level right up to the last building block or the telescope, looking at the faintest light and making sense of what that is. So here, this is our universe, you know, and scientists today have worked. This is by the European Space Agency that shows, boom, the whole thing. And the spark of that divinity is imprinted in everything in this universe, including us. And the vibration of that spark emanates in us as our life force, as our Kundalini force. Swamiji and many great saints have stumbled across that and say, if you decipher that life force or the Kundalini force, you will become aware of the creator that has given us that creative force, that give us that power to live a creative life. And this is what this great saint, this great Mahan has left us. So how do we get there? So how do we understand the creator, the creative force, and our creative life force? So what kind of vehicles, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, techniques? And here, this is Mahan. So he started looking within himself. What is it that gives me consciousness and awareness? My mind is so noisy. I can't focus. So is there a technique to focus all my thoughts? He knew this. He says that my mind is always out there and it gets tired. If I can bring all the thoughts to one place, then my bandwidth of analysis increases. When my bandwidth of analysis increases, then I can become aware of more subtle things. I have the power to understand more subtle things. Right? So he discovered this Kundalini meditation. This is what the elderly person showed him. That hey, this is there's a force. If you are quiet, your mind is quiet, you can experience this. So Mahan followed that trail very carefully and he says, okay, I can get experience, but how do I show others? So this is where his research came. He said, there is a power within me. I can experience it, but I now need to replicate this. You know, scientists are somebody that you discover something, they want to be able to replicate that. If you can't replicate it, then it's not good science. So some said, I can feel it, but how do I show this to others so that they too can feel it? How do I show it to other people who also will experience it? So he started thinking like a scientist. How can I replicate this? So what he started doing is, first he looked at bhakti, all the religious teachings, and then the self-realization, this, this elderly man showed him. But two important pillars that he used, which is rational pursuit, searching step by step, as I showed you, Nothing, something by chance. So his mind was systematic. Not your mind is noisy, you can't do this. It has to be like a scientist, you know, thinking through deeper. What steps should I take? So this is rational pursuit based on reason and logic. And in the same way, he wanted to experience it. He says, you know, Arivin, Arival, Arivin Telibin, that. It's not a theoretical knowledge. It's not an abstract knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. And this is what scientists do. They want to be able to see it. They want to be able to cognize it. Why is this phenomena happening? What are the laws that govern this? This is what Mahan pursued. So he discovered his own spiritual compass that guided him throughout his journey of this discovery. And because the compass was the mind that is you know, inspired by this vibration that can anchor itself and track that vibration, trace the vibration, follow the footprints of the vibration to the summit of the self-realization. So he learned to use his spiritual compass really well, right? Once he learned, once he discovered the spiritual compass, he learned to use it. Then he said, okay, now I can teach other people how to discover their spiritual compass 
and show them how to find their way to their own self or that creator within themselves. So he discovered this, there are parts of the body that helps the mind to be quiet, to get a more magnified version of the life force. We all have the life force, but we don't experience it because our mind is dissipated with many other things. So by quietening the mind, we can actually feel the life forces in our entire body, but more magnified in certain parts of the body. So this is what Mahan's research led him to, you see? So he started thinking deeply that the creator must be embedded in all the creations. The creator's creative force, the vibration must be embedded in all of us, right? So how do I, what can I use to experience this? It has to be my mind, nothing else. If my mind can experience it, I can experience it in every facet of my life. If my mind, even though awakened, but cannot experience it, I will not be able to cognize this. So he started following the trails of the elderly person and his own research. It led him to the first stage of his initiation. He realized that there are parts of the body that has got neurotransmitters that emanates that life force as electrical bioelectromagnetic force field. So he said, I have to then anchor the mind on that to quieten the mind first. So he's able to then slowly learn to manage this force himself and then learn to master it and then learn to see how he can raise it. So he use different techniques. You know, many of you all who learned this meditational method will know there are certain techniques that he taught to be able to bring that vibration from the base spine up to here. Why the base spine? Because it has got the most amount of neurotransmitters at the base. And that ignites, certain practices ignites it, and throughout the spinal cord there are neurotransmitters that brings the vibration, magnifies the vibration third eye. One can ask why? Because our mind is so noisy, we need anchors. When our mind focuses on the magnified vibration, the mind becomes quiet. When the mind becomes quiet, the mind's bandwidth goes up. When the mind's bandwidth goes up, a sense of clarity takes place. You know, sense of, you know, more deeper understanding takes place. This is really amazing, you know. This Mahan found a simple technique to be able to quieten the mind up right? and increase its power. Then he says, great, if everybody did this, then nobody would want to do anything else. He says, but they also have to live a normal life. Right? So he says, okay, let me show how to bring it down back. Because the base of the spine is very important, particularly if you are a householder, you know, for the health of the body, you know, and so on. So sometimes people just practice the third stage and you see that, you know, they have no interest for anything else and eventually they want to become, you know, an aesthetic. But here Mahan says, no, I want to be able to teach it to everybody, householder, youth. So they have to function in this material world until their time is up. So he was able to bring that vibration down. And there are techniques to bring it back to the base of the spine so that the body is healthy, the blood is, you know, nourished. You know, if you're a householder, you're able to have children, you know, continue your life, you know, in the, in the best possible way. So Mahan was one of the first to be able to not only raise the force, but also bring it down. So this is called the descending step. And the third one is actually the cleansing step, which is actually awake, awakening that power center here on the top eye, which is really important. Those who practice this will know that there are important glands in our brain called pituitary and pineal gland. When those areas are magnified, it releases hormones. The hormones that gives you more relax, calmness, coolness. And you see that great saints and sages who practice this, they actually are very calm, cool, gentle, graceful, because you know the practice enables them to become more and more harmonious, more, you know, in harmony with everything. So Mahan this technique and it gives a much more universal outlook, much more, you know, uh, unifies things with around 
you, you know, your thoughts become more harmonious, your words and your actions become more harmonious. And that's why you see that most saints, whenever you see saints, they draw a circle there or the back. Because it's actually, when you practice it, it stimulates parts of your brain that actually raises that vibration. And that gives you that kind of glow and aura. And you see that Mahan shows this you know, step, the third stage, which is actually you know, the, the universal step. So here, the universal, so the three stages of that meditation that Mahan shows in his, and this was his discovery. This is the most important discovery that he made, that he was able to impart this knowledge without, you know, any complex language or any chanting. Just follow the techniques to bring the vibration here, base, and also the top eye. So that's why he says, in the tapas of my awareness, I attain my own self. So, you know, through the practice, he attained that universal outlook. So here, again, he gives this quote after discovering, he says, seeking the inexplicable God, ceaseless, subjective, and inward search. I realize within myself, God in its entirety, that formless, dimensionless divinity that imprinted everything in this four-dimensional universe is also part of me in a wholesome way, in a paripurna way. So he attained that blissful experience. And he says, now I need to be able to show that, get other people to experience this. So it started off with that understanding that higher order continuum that Yiru, understanding the vibration, that cosmic intelligence that is imprinted in, in everything, which he calls the big eye. And it emanates as vibration in us, you know, in the form, you know, we have that heat and light. And it imprints three important personalities in us, you know, the astral, the mental, and the physical body. It's all part of that higher order continuum. You know, so he traced it back like a scientist. Ah, I've got a physical body. I have a mental body, astral body. These are all light, Paranjodi. Unarve, trace it back to that big eye and finally leads you back to the higher order continuum. So he's able to trace back that link, which is spoken about in all the scriptures. But here he shows a practical step to get there. So what are the benefits? Right, so there are many benefits, and this is the benefit that you know Mahan has spoken about it, and some of the benefits that I have experienced that I've documented it by practicing this practice for more than 40 years. So, what leads to this that ultimately that enlightened stage? Number one, the practice is very important, it's just not just meditation, but it's actually about introspection, contemplation, reflection, and meditation. Like a scientist, this is exactly what Mahan did. You know, and you start discovering actually your own purpose in life. You know, many people ask me this question, Guru, uh, what is my purpose in life? I said, the purpose in our life is to live a life of purpose, right? When we discover this divinity, we see that we're able to understand every facet of our life is actually imprinted of that. Yes, our body grows to a certain stage yet. Yes, it'll age, you know, and it'll drop off. This is the natural phenomena of this material world. Most people, you know, can't accept that. But this meditation teaches you, this is an evolution of this imprint. The body may go through this, but the divine spirit is imperishable. And when we know that, we learn to live gracefully, right? And that's what the purpose becomes. Well, you know, when you know your purpose in life, you see that you really enjoy this journey. You have that passion. You know, this is the benefit, passion for life, zest for living, learning, enriching, enlightening, and outliving everything. This is a beautiful part, right? The other wonderful thing is that you become the patience, you know, the calm, cool mind, unperturbed. Yes, the body may be not well. It's okay. This is part of the body's journey. You know, keep the mind healthy and you see that the body will be okay, right? not be agitated. You know, the wonderful thing about life is you are not agitated by 
anything. Nothing can shake you. You know how wonderful that is? You have this, this intensity of perseverance to attain this goal in life to discover the creator in ourselves. Right? If God is infinite, what is the closest distance? It's zero distance from us. It's within us. And that zest to experience that. When we experience that, the divinity you see everywhere. You know, that's relentless search. You know, that's perseverance and persistence. No matter what, there are things that may distract you. No, you come back. Right? And Mahan shows that by doing all this, you attain a divine life, an enlightened life. This is what Paranjodi means. Why we call Nyanavallal Paranjodi Mahan. You see, all Mahan's gurus are called Paranjodi. Paranjodi means that divine light that is imprinted by the Creator. Right? So we learn to divinize every aspect. All of us are Paranjodi. All of us are solar beings. All of us have the light in us. Some are more aware than this. So you have saints like Mahan that actually show us that, you know, how to experience that divinity and how to live a divine life. So this is the wonderful benefit of life. You know, it's a joyful life. What are the important benefits that I experience from this? Number one is that the spiritual capital, you know, there are 10 capitals. The spiritual capital is immense. It's infinite. When we have that, you see that our mental and emotional capital becomes solid. We're not perturbed by anything, you know? And we see that, you know, that our physical capital, our body becomes more healthy. You know, a lot of people today, you know, they get sick, they get all kinds of high blood pressure and all these things because the mind is agitated. You know, we don't have that ability to manage, you know, our mind. Our physical body is impacted. So when our mind is happy and we are healthy, mentally, you see that physically we are also healthy. When we are physically healthy, we see that, you know, our intellectual capital becomes, we know how to think carefully using the spiritual compass. We become more creative. We build creative capital. We acquire the natural capital. And I always say that, you know, nature or the creator has not given everybody everything, but nature and the creator has given everybody something to be excellent. The problem with many people is that they are looking at other people, how they are doing, comparing themselves, and we miss the natural talent in themselves. We may be a good cook, a good poet, a good dancer, a good scientist, a good mathematician, but because we get distracted, we don't you know, discover the blessings that nature has imprinted in us. So Mahan knew from day one, he wanted, he was a businessman. He realized that that is not what nature's capital that is embedded in him. Nature's capital for that embedded in him was to be able to discover nature itself in the form of Kundalini vibration and to articulate that as I got philosophy and impart that knowledge. That was his natural capital, right? It's spoken about thousands of years, but this Mahan made it so simple. So when we discover the natural capital in us, we, you know, we become fantastic social beings. You know, we have the confidence. You know, we have that ability to, you know, have that immense inner resources to be able to relate to everybody and everyone. We're not affected by anything. We have that empowerment, you know, that, that self-sufficiency, empowered capital, the self-sufficiency. I don't know something, I know where to look for it. I don't have the resources, I know how to get the resources, you know? So it is self-sufficiency. You know how wonderful it is to be self-sufficient? And when we when we do that, we see that the leadership in us stands out. Mahan was a leader in his own field. He never went to university, he doesn't have postdoctoral degrees, but yet, you know, he stood out. The same thing with many great saints and sages. If you look at their background, many of them, you know, don't have formal education, but nature was their education. Right. And finally, Mahan's teaching taught me that if you did all this, you would never be materially poor. You will never be financially poor because nature will open up all its resources 
for you to be successful in this life, be self-sufficient, and more importantly, be able to support yourself, your family, and the people around you. So this is what Mahan's teaching you. Become, you know, in Mahan uses a paripurna. Paripurna means complete, wholesome. And that's what it gives you. You may not be a billionaire or millionaire, but you are self-sufficient. Paripurna nila. So this is what Mahan's teaching taught, you know, that spiritual capital leads to the mental, physical, intellectual, creative capital, natural capital, ability to relate to people or what we call relational capital, empowering ourselves to discover that knowledge. As I said, materially, you have sufficiency. And that's what leads to an enlightened and spiritual life. So, what does Mahan's uh, contribution to, to humanity? How to live a wow life, you know, a life with this really awesome, a life that is really, you know, amazing. Every morning you wake up, you go, wow, this is awesome, right? Uh, you won't have Monday morning blues or Tuesday morning blues, you know, or say, thank God it's Friday. You know, every day is a great day. You would not have one day Diwali. Every day is a Diwali day. So I call this the wow life. What is the wow life here? You know, so Mahan's meditation, philosophy helps us to generate the 10 capitals of life. And we live a wow life. What does that mean? It means having that world-class mindset. A mindset that is trailblazing. A mindset that is space-setting. Like Mahan. Everybody talked about this, but he discovered this force, made it simple, made the philosophy so simple that everybody get access to it. That's what peace setting is. Another example is Newton, you know, Isaac Newton. You know, gravity has been there for since the beginning of time, right? Apples have been falling. People have been picking up the apples and eating. But this scientist say, hey, the apple is falling. Let me not just pick the apple and go away. Let me think what is making the apple fall, and he discovered gravity. The same thing with uh, Einstein, discovering the theory of relativity. This Mahan discovered the I God philosophy and to be able to land the mind on the substratum called the soul, that big eye. That's trailblazing. Not only he could do it, he showed other people how to get there. Right? That's amazing. Outstanding. This is another quality is that you discover this brilliant mind, but it not only creates opportunity for us, for our family, but for everybody. He made this accessible to everybody. He traveled around the world, teaching everyone without any expectation, without any rewards, right? Until the age of 80 years old, even his last day on this mortal earth, he gave a satsang before saying, okay, my time is up that opportunity creating mindset. This is amazing, you know? And the last one is actually whatever he did, he wanted it to be winnable. That means it wins the hearts and the minds of people. That which he has discovered, that all his efforts must be able to transform people, must have an impact on people. People who are struggling, people who have you know, health challenges, mental challenges, financial challenges, relationship challenges, you know, courage, self-esteem. When you practice this, you know, it transforms you. And that's what I call a wow mindset. What did Mahan's teaching sh show me? The wow in me, the amazing divinity, the creator, if we put the creative force to practice, we can achieve anything in life, including God realization. And for me, a simple thing, Mahan taught this wow life, how to live a wow life. So this Mahan, for me, was a wow Mahan. Amazing. Right? I hope that, you know, all of you, you know, through this practice, discover the wowness in yourself. If you can do that every day you practice, you'll see the glow, the tejas, the completeness of our lives, the paripurnam that we discover. And this is why today we celebrate this great master who left us with this word called sandosham. Everything that we do, he starts off with sandosham. 
Santam, that sublimity, that calmness, the peacefulness, that, you know, dosa means, you know, challenges in life. When we have sandosham, that means that joy, happiness, the brilliance, you know, no challenges that we can, you know, all challenges we can overcome. We transform the scars into stars, the impossible into I am possible. And this is what this great saints and, and our life journey becomes an awesome, awesome journey. And this is why we celebrate this great Mahan for showing us a simple way to discover the creator in us, the creative force in us, and how to be creative, living a creative and a wonderful and inspirational life. Thank you. Salvation.